Welcome. Welcome to the uh, final colloquium of the spring semester in 2014, and this is a very special colloquium indeed. Every year, the NU or UNL, actually Alumni Association, uh, enlists the nominations of the colleges in the university for alumni who have achieved uh, extraordinarily, extraordinary uh, career achievements and early in their careers in particular. And they call these the Early Achiever Awards. And this year, the department put forward John Scheel as a nominee for the large College of Arts and Sciences with 18 departments. And John was uh, chosen as the college nominee and uh, was recognized officially last night by the Alumni Association as the winner of the CAS Early Achiever Award. John is one of our own, both from the undergraduate ranks and the graduate ranks, and it's a real pleasure to have him back here in Lincoln today. I will not uh, say more other than to introduce his undergraduate and graduate mentor and our own uh, Hewitt Professor of Chemistry, a uh, world expert in bioanalytical chemistry, Professor David Hage, for the formal introduction. Okay, thank you. So uh, John and I have a long history together. Uh, he started with me as a sophomore and went all the way through graduate school, got his PhD, and we still interact, obviously, with one another, see each other at meetings. To give a bit of history behind John, uh, he's a Nebraska native, came to UNL, started as a biology major, then changed to chemistry major, he took freshman chemistry. Uh, he has many, many scholarships and fellowships, as an undergraduate even, like the Canfield Scholarship, the Simons Memorial Scholarship, the Chancellor's Award, Sandoz Scholarship, and so on. Uh, he had a UCARE Fellowship when he was working in my lab. And then as a graduate student, uh, he had many options to go other places, but he decided to stay here. So uh, we worked on what we thought would be a good research program for him, and he came through on that. Uh, he won also many awards for that work. He got a Chemistry Department Korean Alumni Research Award, which we just gave out a couple weeks ago to our current class of graduate students. He received the Sigma Xi Outstanding Graduate Award in 2009. Uh, he received a, he did a special symposium at the HPLC conference in 2008 for young investigators. He had an Othmer's Fellowship. He had an American Chemical Society Analytical Division Fellowship, which there's only 10 or 12 of those every year, and he was one of the recipients of that. He was the very first recipient of the Bioanalysis Young Investigator Award for the Journal of Bioanalysis, and he's since received other awards as well. Uh, as a graduate student, as an undergraduate also, I counted and he had a total of 13 publications in my group, six with him as first author and five as second author, so very productive in terms of publications. A uh, couple things I remember about John is first of all, this is a very unusual day for both of us. First of all, we both have ties on. And uh, second of all, John doesn't have a baseball cap on. Those of you who remember, remember when he was an undergraduate here, he always had a baseball cap on. I think I only saw him like two or three times the entire time he was here without a baseball cap. Also, uh, in terms of writing, besides being indicated by the papers he's written, uh, I do have my students write weekly reports for me, which I started when he was a graduate student here. And John wrote some of the longest research reports every week that I've ever seen. They're almost papers in themselves, so that was very good. Uh, he's also a very hands-on person. He loved to get into the lab. So along with Corey Unmuck, who's also here, they're the people who are in charge of taking apart HPLC systems and putting them together and building lots of detectors and things for me. Uh, he's also very interested in the theory of how things work. So he's one of the students I've had that's probably the most interested in chromatographic band broadening theory. I actually went to the details of that and came out with some derivations out of it. And uh, overall, uh, he's a great student, been very productive, as you'll see in his research now. Uh, at NIST, he went there as a postdoc after he finished graduate school here, National Institutes of Standards and Technology, then took on a permanent position, and now he runs one of the labs in the biological division there. So with that, uh, let him do his talk about his research, and let's thank again John for coming here to receive this award. All right, uh, well, thank you very much, Dave, for that uh, warm welcome. And I want to thank everyone from the department today for welcoming me back, uh, especially the professors that I knocked on your doors five or 10 times a day to ask questions when I was here as a student. Um, it was nice that you let me in today to ask you questions again and discuss your research. So uh, I really do appreciate the warm welcome, and it's great to be back here at Nebraska 
as I've said before, there truly is no place like Nebraska, so it's definitely great to be back. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is start to share a little bit about some of the work we've been doing with biopharmaceutical characterization and kind of tell the story of the culmination of where this project has gone, gone over the last five years uh, into developing a reference material that we think is going to help quite a bit for development of new therapeutics as well as biosimilars or uh, follow-on molecules of this class. Uh, but first I wanted to touch base a little bit about the National Institute of Standards and Technology and discuss our agency because we are a little different uh, than what you might think of for many agencies in that we're a non-regulatory agency, so we don't actually tell uh, pharmaceutical companies or other companies you need to do this, uh, you need to meet these specifications, but rather we provide technology and standard either materials or physical tests. Uh, items or uh, methods and calibrators to assist in the measurement science and the metrology with determining uh, whatever technological problem uh, they need, need, may need to mount. Uh, so the overall purpose then is to promote uh, U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness. So as part of the Department of Commerce, we work very closely with industry uh, to try to foster innovation and help them uh, make the next generation of materials uh, for the uh, U.S. marketplace. Uh, so I want to start by talking about uh, biopharmaceuticals. So this is the uh, specific area that we're going to be discussing and that I've been working in. Uh, for the most part, we've been looking at monoclonal antibodies. So we'll talk more about the structure of these throughout the talk. Uh, but essentially, this is the largest class of biotherapeutic compounds currently in the pipeline. Uh, this is a very class-specific type protein, so a reference material uh, of this type is quite suitable to what NIST does. So in order to produce one of these monoclonal antibody uh, uh, drug products, actually, the first step is to identify a monoclonal antibody that targets some specific disease state, whether that be cancer or rheumatoid arthritis or a number of other indications. Uh, the gene sequence that encodes for the primary protein is then cloned into an expression vector. This is transfected into a uh, cellular population. Uh, this is typically murine expression system or uh, there are human and humanized cell lines as well. Uh, that then are grown up in fermentation bioreactors pr to produce very large quantities of the secreted protein of interest. Uh, these can be ramped up pr to produce up to about 10 grams per liter of the uh, protein of interest, which is then purified. And I'd like to note that throughout this downstream purification process, one of the most important uh, stages is affinity chromatography uh, to, to select out the IgGs to purify about to 95% followed by some additional uh, purification steps. That drug substance is then formulated into a product that will eventually be given in the clinic uh, for some sort of therapeutic use. So as you can imagine, throughout this entire stage, there's a lot of process optimization that goes on into making the desired biopharmaceutical, but then there's also a lot of work that goes into characterization of the product as a function of how the process may change and over time as this product is used in the uh, clinic. So there's a uh, necessity to do a very high level physical chemical and biophysical characterization of product related substances as we'll see uh, there's a number of heterogeneous, heterogeneous subspecies. Uh, this isn't a single well defined chemical entity, but also characterization of product related impurities or those unwanted degradation products or potential byproducts that are made in the stage uh, that we don't want to see in the final drug product. And we also need to characterize and understand uh, how these might affect clinical utility. So taking a quick overview of the overall process for developing a lot of that drug, we also need to take a very large look at how these drugs are produced throughout the overall life cycle. And so this is a relatively busy slide, but it describes essentially everything that happens from uh, the initial inception of a project all the way through commercialization of a given drug substance. And so these companies have a large repository of internal historical data. Uh, most of these companies have been producing uh, IgG molecules throughout years. They have platform technologies that they use uh, to then go after new targets and new indications. And they use a lot of that historical data to feed forward into their first initial technical development uh, in these projects. Now throughout the initial development phase, which I should mention takes about 10 years uh, for one of these complex products before uh, getting to a commercial stage, there's initial uh, clinical testing and uh, in vitro testing to look at the safety and efficacy of the drug product. And throughout this time, process changes are occurring that actually may result to slight changes in the overall molecule. So again, uh, throughout the development life cycle, unlike a small molecule like aspirin, the molecule actually changes throughout time and you therefore need to have some sort of standard uh, to look at that change. 
And during this development process, then, it's an interim or in-house reference standard that we'll talk about here in a few minutes, uh, which is an actual lot of your particular drug substance uh, that you set aside and essentially compare every future batch of that lot to in order to ensure that you're consistently producing a new drug product. So at the time of actually going into late stage clinical trials, so this is where you have a sufficient population to taste, test the uh, true safety and efficacy of the drug product, a very large lot of your specific, again, in-house primary reference standard uh, needs to be developed, and it is uh, intended that this primary material will last throughout the life cycle of that drug. As long as it's being sold on the marketplace, this primary reference standard will be used for comparability in order to qualify in-house working standards, again, of your uh, particular drug of interest. So as you can imagine, throughout this long life cycle of uh, clinical development, as well as uh, characterizing these reference materials and having them available for uh, quality control testing, there's also evolution of the analytical technologies and the methodologies that you're going to use to characterize these molecules. Ten years is a long time in mass spectrometry world, and a lot of changes can happen over that time. So you can imagine there needs to be some way to understand how that data you collected on the first day might compare with the data you collected on the last day. And during this uh, project evolution, your product is changing, so can you really compare some technology used on day one to one that you can used on day 10? Uh, so this is an example of where a reference material might come in useful in that you can look at your methods over time with a common uh, metrology or external control and see how your analytical methods are changing. Uh, use this external control to feed forward essentially into historical data and have a common material throughout industry uh, that not only your company but other companies and regulatory agencies uh, can see exactly uh, what these characterization technologies are telling you about this particular class of molecule. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about a reference material, and I really like this uh, quote that was given by uh, Stephen Kozlowski. He's the director at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the uh, FDA, and he kind of gave NIST a shout out in this testimony in front of the U.S. House of Representatives uh, Science and Technology Committee saying that with the development of new methods uh, comes the need for development of new standards in order to evaluate them. And that's really the global purpose of this reference material. Uh, because a well-characterized and certified reference material is a great way to really assess the precision and accuracy of complex analytical methods, both within a lab and across labs. Use that data to identify potential gaps in development, so where we might not be characterizing these molecules uh, to the level necessary. And it'll also facilitate adoption of new technologies. So in a company where you have a regulatory filing about a product using a specific method, it's very difficult to change to a new manufacturer or even a new HPLC column. You need to show that that method is robust and transferable and gives you the same information. So even having an external molecule to do these types of comparisons and show the agency on a known molecule that uh, this is uh, actually the case would be very useful. So in the last case, uh, easing the regulatory burden and allowing them a common kind of training tool or, or something to look at to really understand how this complex class of molecule behaves in a number of different uh, analytical approaches. So now to get to the actual NIST monoclonal antibody reference material uh, to discuss what it is. So this is a humanized monoclonal antibody of an IgG1 kappa subclass that's expressed in uh, NS0 marine suspension culture. Uh, so we're calling this a drug-like substance. So this was expressed and produced in exactly the same way that a, bio, a biopharmaceutical would be under complete good manufacturing protocol, uh, purified with all the typical downstream purification that you would normally see for a drug product, but this one just happens to not be intended for use in humans. Uh, so we have a couple of different formulations, one at 100 milligrams per mil and one at 10 mg per mil, and these are all about 98% monomeric purity. Uh, so this number isn't actually the, uh, the purity number, and this also is not a certified value at NIST. Uh, that's coming down the road, of course. Uh, but it's a very high purity and high concentration monoclonal antibody. So we talked a little bit about these definitions, and this actually has been uh, something that's been debated at conferences over the last couple years as these reference materials are coming down the line, is how to define things. So you'll hear me talk about an in-house standard so again, that is the in-house manufacturer-specific drug substance that's their identity, whereas the reference material is a class-specific material of the IgG1 kappa subtype uh, that's been established by NIST for certain uh, uses in analytical measurements. 
Eventually, we'll also transfer this into a standard reference material uh, where we'll use higher order characterization uh, and analytical techniques to more fully evaluate uh, the precision of the analytical measurements we're making uh, and we'll have actual certified values. Uh, so basically, the level of uh, precision that we can measure certain attributes is whether it's a uh, reference value or a standard reference value. So now getting into the complexity of measuring these uh, large products, and I also like this slide that I borrowed from uh, one of my colleagues. In looking at an Airbus uh, 380, these are the large double-decker planes that you see going to trips to Europe. They're about 361 tons versus a small motorcycle that you might envision down below on the interstate here. And this is a good relative comparison of how large a monoclonal antibody is compared to a traditional small molecule drug like aspirin. So with these large antibodies, we're looking at secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. These are very large three-dimensional and floppy uh, uh, materials. And there can be a lot of minor heterogeneities in there that we need to characterize to really understand the identity of this heterogeneous population of a drug product. And this essentially tells you the complexity uh, based on a size story. And looking at a cartoon figure of the complexity of the monoclonal antibodies, uh, you can also see a number of different attributes just uh, looking closely uh, that need to be characterized. So again, these are uh, pep proteins of uh, quaternary structure consisting of two light chains and two heavy chains that are linked uh, with disulfide bonds. There's a couple of different regions that are quite important. Uh, the FAB region has the antigen binding or the CDR uh, that actually binds whatever target, whether it be a virus or cancer or uh, bacteria. It binds that with a very high affinity. And then in many cases for especially the cancer drugs, the FC portion is equally important or the uh, fraction crystallizable as this is the portion of the molecule that's actually going to elicit a response from the immune system and cause clearance of uh, whatever the infection may be. So some of the additional complexity we'll go through in time, but I do want to mention the two glycosylation sites. Uh, each of these heavy chains is glycosylated, and this adds a significant amount of heterogeneity to the overall molecule. So moving beyond the cartoon structure, again, seeing the three-dimensional protein, uh, this is actually a, a three-dimensional rendering based on the primary amino acid sequence of the protein grafted onto previous uh, X-ray crystal structures. Uh, so this is a theoretical model of what it looks like, and you can see all of the beta sheets, uh, the three-dimensional folds of this uh, protein product, and really appreciate the complexity of these large molecules. So in starting to characterize the identity of the NIST antibody, I'll refer to some of this data as if it were a drug product, so you'll hear me talking about activity assays and and clinical efficacy, because I think it's the best way to elucidate why we're doing some of these characterization assays. Uh, but in fact, keep in mind, this is not going to be a drug product and not for use in humans. So the first step in the characterization is looking at the primary amino acid sequence. Again, we know what this should be based on the DNA that we've put into our expression system. And we need to characterize this with a number of different assays. So the first way you'd see to uh, characterize the molecule is to look at it intact. So not do any derivations, not uh, cut it in any way, and essentially put it into a mass spectrometer. Uh, so on the right here, we see an intact uh, deconvoluted mass spectrum of the NIST monoclonal antibody. Uh, high mass accuracy actually allows us to see a number of the different glycoforms immediately uh, of the molecule, and we'll talk more about these individual glycosylation sites. But with the high mass accuracy, we can get very good resolution of these individual species. And we can also see minor modifications at the intact level. So one of the things we note right away about the primary sequence is the end terminus of the heavy chain has a pyroglutamation uh, that formed as opposed to just the free glutamine. Uh, and also on the C terminus, we're seeing predominantly loss of the lysine residue. So this is something that's very common in uh, IgGs expressed in the murine system. They'll lose one or two of their C terminal residues due to a, a carboxypeptidase. And based on the high mass accuracy, we can quickly see that as well as some of this glycan functionality. There's a few of these uh, lower abundant species that are labeled with numbers. Uh, these have been identified as minus gluconac, and we can also see a few plus hex peaks that we're calling glycation in this case. So the resolution at the intact level isn't quite that good. Uh, we're running here, I mean, it's great, but it's not enough to see unit resolution at this point. So in actuality, there's a couple of peaks, for example, in this five and seven, that there's mul multiple different uh, proteoforms uh, that are being identified here as a minus gluconac uh, species. And we can get a little bit better information on that by uh, deglycosylating the protein, uh, getting rid of that minus gluconac. And now we can see for the deglycosylated, again, the majority of this IgG is intact with the N-terminal uh, pyroglutamation and the C-terminal loss of lysine. 
We also see a small amount of uh, loss of the C-terminal glycine next to the lysine, uh, which is something we didn't see in the intact with the glycosylation. And we're also seeing verification of some of the molecule with a plus lysine residue, which we weren't able to identify due to, uh, the, uh, to this technique's uh, resolution, the same M over C or the same deconvoluted mass as some of these minus gluconac peaks. So essentially we're able to uh, verify with this intact mass spectrometry some of the minor heterogeneity uh, aspects that are present in this molecule. And so far we're saying we do have the NIST monoclonal antibody consistent with the expected primary sequence. So the next stage is to look at smaller and smaller pieces of this molecule. Uh, the next uh, analytical technique we've been using is middle down mass spectrometry. So in this case we're using an enzyme known as IDES or the fabricator enzyme to cleave the monoclonal at the hinge region, uh, resulting in an FAB2 as well as two separate FCs. Uh, with reduction of this molecule, then we get the individual uh, light chains from one another, as well as two SCFC regions uh, down at the bottom. So again, we can perform LC, MS, MS uh, using this high mass accuracy instrument to look at the individual fragments. Uh, with chromatography now on the smaller portions, each about 25 kilodaltons, we can now see resolution of a few of these additional species, for example, the plus lysine. Uh, the mass spectrometry of these reveals, again, a lot of those same post-translational modifications we were seeing in the intact portion. But now that we're looking at smaller uh, fragments, we get higher resolution, and we can then confirm to a higher confidence this N-term pyroglutamation, uh, the glycation sites being localized now to the, uh, uh, excuse me, variable domain uh, of the heavy chain. The light chains being unmodified, and again, some of those same modifications to the uh, uh, glycosylation site and that uh, C terminal region uh, of the IgG. So, finally, to verify that this again is consistent with the uh, pr expected primary sequence of the molecule, we'll go to the more robust and commonly used technique of peptide mapping. And so, peptide mapping is uh, digestion of the protein with trypsin, which cleaves after each of the lysine and arginine residues and run this on an LCMS gradient. So in the biopharmaceutical industry, we do something a little bit differently than a proteomics industry, which is instead of identifying a few peptides in a protein and saying that that protein is present, we actually want to look at every single peptide on the molecule, and we really want to identify every single amino acid with our MSMS spectrum. In order to do that, there's quite a bit of uh, digest optimization uh, for the individual molecules. Uh, before we started using IgG, some of our previous uh, analytical digest did a pretty poor job. And our first run with, uh, for example, rapid gest and, and just a quick short gradient was about 50% coverage of the sequence. Uh, so with optimization, however, and longer gradients, at the peptide level, we're able to get about 98% coverage of the uh, heavy chain and about 96% coverage of the light, light chain. So again, this is at the peptide level. We are doing MSMS fragmentation and looking for those individual amino acid B and Y ions. Um, we haven't quite gotten uh, at the amino acid level, but the next stage is to actually look at different fragmentation techniques. And the final LCMS run for characterization will most likely have a segment for each individual peptide seen throughout that has an optimized set of fragmentation conditions in order to get the most information about each and every amino acid in that uh, MS2 stage. But essentially what this is telling us at the peptide level, again, we're getting 100% sequence coverage with multiple enzymes. And again, the NIST monoclonal antibody is consistent with the DNA sequence as we'd expect. So that's great news that we're able to characterize that we have what we should have in the first place. So the next stage in this characterization is to really look for things that you don't expect to be there or you don't want to be there. And those are uh, typical post-translational modifications, which again uh, comes up as part of that peptide mapping search. And we can see by adding in variable modifications, there's low levels of uh, quite a few different PTMs, including oxidation, deamidation, and glycation of certain lysine residues uh, throughout the sequence of the NIST antibody. So these are all in relatively low levels in the NIST antibody. Uh, most everything is below 1%. Uh, some of these that are bolded are about 2 or 3% relative abundance. And the uh, final conclusion on all that, if this were a drug product, is that's perfectly fine. It's okay to have various post-translational modifications in a drug product as long as you can produce them consistently and they've shown, been shown to be safe and efficacious in the clinic. But what we do need to know is that since these sites are able to uh, form PTMs 
and there's various modifications present at various levels, we need to know how this molecule is going to behave if it's stressed. So if we ship this molecule uh, to somewhere else to be given to a patient and it sits on the airplane tarmac for a few hours or uh, the person delivering the box drops it, how is that going to affect uh, these post-translational modifications? So we do a series of uh, stress tests or accelerated stabilities on our IgG molecules uh, that include uh, chemical stress tests as well as physical stress. So we use high and low pH to uh, affect deamidation, oxidation with both chemical and uh, light methods, as well as ad adding in very small quantities of uh, reducing agents to see what effect that may have on the overall molecule and its uh, final activity. In addition, we look at physical stresses that may be present during uh, transport, so freezing, thawing, elevated temperatures, and mechanical stresses, which can get quite fun. As we'll see later, we had to do a, a number of different stresses to actually make the NIST antibody aggregate. So kind of coming up with ideas of how you can hurt your molecule is, is a pretty fun activity to do in the lab. Um, but essentially, after we have this degraded material, we do it for two purposes. Uh, the first is to form this degraded material because as a drug product, we need to know what uh, behavior this is going to have in the clinic. So if we're forming oxidation species or aggregated species, is that going to affect the safety and efficacy? So we can then collect these degraded species and do activity binding assays, um, immuno uh, assays to uh, tell whether the activity of the FC effector function has changed. And in addition to that, we can elucidate the degradation pathways to tell us what we should be looking for in future drug products, uh, which assays are going to tell us that this particular lot is bad and maybe be a, ba a bad uh, behavior and we need to get rid of before it goes to the clinic. So this is just a representative peptide mapping of uh, one of those stress studies. And you can see after treating this material with uh, hydrogen peroxide for one week, uh, we see in the UV trace a uh, disappearance of this peak and a reappearance of a new peak at 49 minutes. And again, with MSMS peptide mapping, we can localize that post-translational modification uh, to this particular methionine residue. And now we know that uh, this is, in fact, a stability-indicating method uh, with respect to that methionine residue. So if we determine that this is something that's important to the overall activity of the drug, we might monitor for the absence of this peak uh, with a very high precision in looking at future lots of the drug. Uh, so just a representative example of how these uh, may be used to uh, assess future lots and know what's going on with your particular product. So up to this point, I've talked to a number of, uh, of uh, mass spectrometry-based assays, but all of these also are using chromatography in the front end. But not only is chromatography a front end of the mass spectrometer, but it tells us a lot of information about the molecules. And eventually, a number of these LC-based assays become lot release to tell us information about the lot and ensure that they are within specifications of quality control. So a number of representative methods include size exclusion chromatography, looking at aggregates of the protein molecules, uh, cation exchange and uh, capillary uh, CEIEF for looking at charge variants, reverse phase and hillock chromatography to look at hydrophobic, as well as capillary SDS to look at the purity of these individual molecules. So this is just an example of a size exclusion chromatogram run, again, on the NIST antibody, where we see a molecular weight marker. Uh, the elution of the NIST antibody is at about uh, where the 150 kilodaltons would be, which we expect. And we don't see any significant amount of dimer, trimer, or any smaller uh, abundant species. So again, this is a monomeric purity test. And the question is, that's great. We see one peak. It's what we expect for the antibody. But is this method going to be able to detect if we're getting aggregates in our species uh, due to shaking or improper storage or some production method? So this is where, again, those uh, studies come in to see how we can beat this molecule to make it aggregate. So we did a number of things, including shaking at elevated temperatures. I even boiled the solution, and that went a little too far, so uh, didn't go that far. But essentially, we tried some elevated temperatures, shaking, stirring, uh, freezing and thawing. And eventually, UV at uh, 500 watts actually works well. After about a week, we can form about 7% of aggregate and about 10% uh, of these smaller uh, fragmentation peaks. So again, we can fraction collect these, do MSMS peptide mapping and understand what modifications are actually occurring to form these aggregates. Uh, in this case, this is a tryptophan oxidation that we were able to localize uh, as well. So these are very important studies to understand how your molecule might degrade and in what conditions they might degrade um, <clears throat> and essentially tell us now that we do, in fact, have a method that's going to tell us if we get degraded or aggregated material in the future, we'll be able to see that. And we can now use this as a lot release method, essentially. 
So aggregation, I want to mention, is of a particular concern, and this isn't uh, something I'll talk about in detail. But the monomers and the trimers, of course, are something you don't want to see in your drug product. But you can also imagine on the submicron range, you wouldn't want to be injected with these large particles in micrometer sizes of these aggregate proteins. So this is a really big problem in the metrology side of things because these proteins are relatively translucent when they start to aggregate to these large sizes. They have so many shapes and sizes and there really isn't a good analytical technology to count the number of these particles in a drug material or to tell you the shape and size of these particles. Uh, so NIST actually has a separate very large program uh, just developing standards for uh, determining the size and the number of these micrometer sized particles. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting side note, uh, again, leading that aggregation can lead to even worse uh, issues with the product. So now I'll get into uh, the last post-translational modification that I'll discuss, which is glycosylation. Uh, this is actually the first uh, set of analytical methods that we started developing uh, when I got to NIST. And glycosylation adds a significant amount of heterogeneity to the monoclonal antibodies. So the glycans here uh, are formed initially by a common core. So there's two N-acetylglucosamine residues and three mannose residues that begin this core. And then additional decorations can go beyond that for an individual glycan, including high mannose forms with a number of mannose, uh, complex forms with N-acetylglucosamine and galactose residues, and a hybrid that would have extending uh, mannose here, as well as complex type branches uh, on the other side. So typically in monoclonal antibodies, you'll see some high mannose glycans and some biantenary. But we should note in the NIST antibody we'll see in a bit as well as others, you can also start seeing tetraantenary uh, up to four uh, chains off of these carbohydrates. So you can imagine that there's significant complexity combined with the fact that each of these glycosylation sites doesn't necessarily just have one glycan attached, but rather each molecule may have a different glycan attached to the same site, again leading to a number of glycoforms added on top of all those different proteoforms due to the post-translational modifications. So that being said, there's a very wide uh, variety of analytical technologies that have been developed for glycosylation, specifically focusing just on this post-translational modification. And in short, really a standard is needed to look at what these individual methods tell us, what the levels of detection and uh, what level of detail uh, we're actually getting from the various methodologies. So some of the uh, protocols that I've developed at NIST, uh, again, include proteolysis, uh, using uh, LCMS to then look at glycan sequence at a compositional level. Uh, you can do some relative quantification of this with area under the curve analysis, as well as telling the glycosylation condition. But the largest use in uh, industry is actually site occupancy, or telling how much of your protein is actually glycosylated. So once you deglycosylate an antibody, they become uh, typically insoluble. And so having around 98 to 99% site occupancy is somewhat expected. And so uh, the triptych digest and uh, doing a couple of other techniques with labeled D2O are very important for uh, that measurement. What I'm going to be talking about mostly today is the common glycoprofiling that is done uh, on released antibodies. In this case, the glycan is released from the protein using an enzyme, uh, PNGASF, which selectively removes only the end glycans of interest. These are then purified out and labeled at the reducing or this functional terminus with the fluorophore so that each glycan essentially has one fluorophore, allowing us to get relative quantification based on the fluorescence signal, but using a mass spectrometer to do MS and MSMS uh, characterization to understand the glycan sequence compositional uh, information. So this is what I'll talk about mostly today. This gives us quite a bit of information about the complex glycoprofile. Uh, we also have methodologies, and we published a paper recently on permethylation, uh, where we're actually adding methyl groups to a variety of hydroxyls here to give uh, more fragmentation info at multiple rounds of collision-induced dissociation and actually elucidate which oxygens each of these individual branches are attached to uh, on the growing oligosaccharide. So there's quite a bit of characterization and essentially each level of characterization gives you a slightly bit of different information about the glycan present. And all of this information is very important because glycosylation can impact the stability the immunogenicity, and eventually the activity, especially if the molecule is involved in effector functions as part of its uh, overall mode of action. So this is what you'd see for a typical glycoprofile that you might get, uh, again, in a, a typical uh, drug application process, where usually they'll apply <clears throat> a robust set of data with a lot of these fluorescence profiles, and some of the higher abundance glycan species will be listed, 
Uh, in this case, I've listed here in the, in the proposed structures everything above 1%. But if you dig a little bit deeper in the weeds, do a higher injection quantity or even low, but report essentially down to below about half a percent, we're seeing over 30 different glycans on the NIST antibody. So you can actually identify quite a few glycans based on this technique that we weren't seeing on intact or middle down or peptide mapping, but rather you're getting a very comprehensive analysis of all the different structures present on an IgG. So this is actually pretty typical of an IgG. So if someone tells you there's only G0F, G1F, and G2F, it's, it just isn't correct. Uh, there's a lot of different structures present, and albeit at low abundance, some of those could be potential bad actors that could cause some serious problems in the clinic. And a few examples of those uh, are present on the NIST antibody, which is actually a good thing for a reference material. So this is actually an MSMS spectra of a couple of uh, silated species. So this is N-acetylneuraminic acid on the terminus of this glycan. Uh, this is N-glycolylneuraminic acid here. The N-glycolylneuraminic acid is actually not produced in humans. So when we produce one of these drug substances in a mouse-based cell system, uh, we can get anti-glycan antibodies against these uh, structures again, potentially causing immunogenic uh, rejection of these species. So having a rapid technique to quickly elucidate the difference or the presence of these species is very present, uh, very uh, important. And in this case, it's quite easy based on these B3 fragmentation ions to see that this terminal uh, fragment is decorated with a nana or an uh, N-acetyl neuraminic acid and here the N-glycolyl form. Uh, so again, our mass spectrometry assay is quickly and easily picking this up as a detection method. There's another one as well, this uh, gal-alpha-gal epitope uh, also is a terminal decoration that can be potentially immunogenic, and this is something that's very important to be able to pick up in your assays. And again, our glycoprofile is picking up both of these uh, in a number of different uh, linkage structures uh, in the NIST monoclonal antibody. So a couple other things, and this is one of the utilities I think that I'll bring out of this as an actual reference material, is we saw the number of different techniques and, uh, you know, proteolysis versus release but also there's a number of different ways to go about each of those individual techniques. So there's probably about 10 different fluorescent labels you can use. You could use uh, uh, UV labels. Uh, you can do your reaction with typical shift base chemistry, or you can add in boric acid and do it in methanol. There's a wide variety of ways that different companies and different people do their uh, analytical procedures. Everybody uses a different solid phase extraction step to purify uh, after the labeling. And the question really becomes, what is that doing to your overall analytical data in the end? So are you getting a consistent profile between two companies that might de be developing uh, the same biosimilar? So when a regulator sees an application and they see method A and method B in two different glyco profiles, how are they going to know which of those is actually a good biosimilar and which is not? And this slide really elucidates that uh, because in running our glyco profile of the NIST antibody initially, we see this nice profile, and if you just look quickly between uh, one before and after an additional C18 cleanup step, they look pretty close to one another. Uh, a higher quantity was injected in this case, but overall the uh, profiles look pretty close unless you look at these highlighted species. And in this case, we're seeing a, a big reduction in this uh, NGNA containing species. Uh, again, that's one of those potentially immunogenic uh, glycans. And we see that actually in all of the new GC containing glycan species that they're reduced when the C18 step is added to the workflow. So again, this is something that a reviewer might not pick up. It's, it is a very low abundant species, but let's say you're reporting to the agency, I've got very low levels of NGNA, there's no immunogenicity concerns here, but you use the C18 step, and that might not be a small detail in you know, 100 pages that someone's looking for, and it might not be something that they've seen before that that particular SPE methodology could affect the apparent glyco profile. So it's this type of historical data that can be really useful for uh, teaching and understanding what different analytical methods might affect what properties of the monocle, monocle, uh, monoclonal antibody uh, and know then exactly that you are in fact characterizing the identity of the molecule and not getting some of these uh, sample preparation artifacts. So moving past a little bit of this uh, method development and method optimization, uh, there's a wide variety of uh, different things we go through on each new antibody we characterize. Uh, the label type is the first one, uh, different labeling conditions, temperatures, and solid phase extraction steps. But eventually we come to a, a nice optimized method for the individual species. And for IgGs, this has become relatively a platform method as they all behave very similar to one another. And so I'll talk more about an interlaboratory comparison, but I like this slide as a comparison uh, between the NIST analysis and that of the uh, National Institute of Bioprocessing 
Research and Technology, or NIBERT, uh, in Dublin, Ireland. And if we look at the glycans that were identified by the two labs, again, we're using completely different uh, analytical methods, different workflows. And in fact, the glycans that we identify that are in common are about 99.3% uh, based on the fluorescence intensity um, of the total glycan containing species. So each lab is identifying some unique species that the other is not, but they're very relative, very low abundance. Uh, each one was less than 0.2%. Uh, so overall, we're seeing very good qualitative agreement uh, with the overall glycan identities. In addition to that, looking at the quantitative agreement between this, this plot shows a pretty good uh, representation between the quantities of the individual glycans identified. Again, there are some small differences in the large abundance species, and the question then becomes, okay, these two labs are seeing very minor differences. Uh, in glyco world, this is actually very good uh, comparable data. But the question is, where is that small difference coming from? And why are we identifying, even though these are very low abundant species, probably lower than most people would report to the FDA, where is that uh, variability coming from? And the answer is actually in the chromatography and our detection method in this case. Uh, NIBRD is using a method called the GU units, uh, which are based on retention time. In the NIST data, I'm using the mass spectrometry based identification. But also, uh, it was the chromatographic selectivity, coelution of species that can then suppress detection depending on the method you're doing, uh, that actually was resulting in the differentiation of these identities. When in fact, I prepared a sample at NIST using my analytical methodology. Uh, Henning, our collaborator, prepared one at NIBERT, and the samples were then both run in Ireland at NIBERT. We see identical profiles other than a couple of very tiny uh, uh, little fragments that were easily identified uh, as actual sample preparation artifacts. But essentially these profiles overlay with one and over very nicely. The same glycans can be identified and essentially we're getting a very harmonized, robust method that's transferable between labs, which is what you really need in a global marketplace for uh, biopharmaceuticals. Okay, so there's a, I've shown a lot of mass spectrometry data and a lot of separation science data today. But I have to say there's a lot of other work going on at NIST with this monoclonal antibody. Uh, it's a very large project with a number of people doing a variety of different analytical techniques. Uh, so if characterization of primary sequence and glycoanalysis isn't your thing, uh, we've also got a number of different uh, analytical uh, characterization going on with concentration. Uh, actually measuring the extinction coefficient of these molecules is something of interest uh, to the community and being able to do uh, high level accurate uh, concentration certifications. Uh, higher order structure is something we're doing quite a bit of as well. Uh, we have a group that has a 900 megahertz NMR and we were recently able to collect a very good spectrum, a 2D spectrum of the FAB region. Uh, we're trying to, to get that up to do an intact antibody, but I don't think that's going to even happen at the 900 megahertz level. Uh, it's going a little high. Uh, but we can get some very good fingerprint data for uh, the FABs. Uh, so we're gearing up to do a round robin study with that with a number of agencies. Uh, in addition, there's some biophysical measurements that uh, are done around NIST. Uh, that I didn't get to talk about today to look at some of those same uh, properties of the molecule, uh, AUC for looking at aggregation. Uh, MALS is a pretty interesting uh, type of uh, detector used uh, for HPLC that can give you molecular weight and hydrodynamic radius information. And then uh, techniques for secondary structure, CD and FTIR. And I definitely would, I uh, haven't talked too much about these methods either. Uh, neutron based measurements, binding and activity assays as well as rheology are all things that this uh, NIST monoclonal antibody will eventually be characterized uh, for and have quite a bit of historical data. So what we see this as essentially is a collaboration between NIST industry and regulatory agencies uh, where industry is actually interested in the current and emerging and developing technology to characterize this class of molecule. Uh, the regulatory agencies need to look at that data and assure the safety and efficacy of the drug product. And we hope that NIST can then provide a common material that allows a more direct discussion between uh, industry and the regulators in order to facilitate development of uh, originator and follow-on biological products. And so in this being a collaborator, collaborative process, doing all this characterization at NIST isn't uh, a great thing unless we have uh, widespread support from our industry and regulatory partners. Uh, so with this uh, monoclonal antibody, we actually kicked off a book project uh, with a couple of collaborators. Uh, Oleg Borisov at Novavax and Daryl Davis at Janssen. And I sent this monoclonal antibody then to about 100 different people throughout industry and academia. And they're writing individual chapters then on the actual characterization data. So we're using the molecule as a topic for a how-to book of what are the various steps you need to go through for a well-characterized biopharmaceutical uh, protein. 
And so we'll be having a background section on uh, the antibody heterogeneity, uh, talking about the structure. We'll have all of the uh, analytical methods that I discussed today and more, uh, doing the protein characterization lab of today, showing the current state of the art technologies. And then finally, the last book, we'll look at some emerging technologies that are coming down uh, through the pipeline for better characterization of these drug molecules. Uh, Top-down sequencing, there's some new biophysical instrumentation uh, that actually hasn't been released that we'll be publishing as well. Uh, so essentially the great thing here, though, is it's going to give us a baseline uh, set of data that's not just NIST data on this antibody, but really prepared with industry collaboration and by industry members in industry labs. So this book should have uh, the highest order imaginable and very widespread collaboration of the NIST monoclonal antibody and really serve as a reference for teaching additional people uh, looking to get into this field and not only teaching them uh, based on book learning, but they can also buy the molecule or, or use this then down the road to reproduce those methods and improve upon those methods uh, as uh, we go down the path of this uh, development process. So with that, I'd like to conclude uh, that we were developing this reference material, uh, plan to supplement the in-house reference material programs of the biopharmaceutical companies. We think that this method will uh, streamline implementation of new technology, assist in qualification or uh, the suitability of these uh, individual methods for their purpose. And also, I didn't discuss much today, but also be used as a system suitability standard. So when a particular analytical method fails, you can run the NIST antibody. Uh, this is going to be a stable, again, widely available material. So you can test your instrument performance and differentiate artifacts that are analytical related versus uh, material related. Globally, we think that this is going to lead to a uh, more and even more so harmonization of approaches for characterization. And we hope to one day with the regulators have a subset of uh, X, Y, and Z need to be done to characterize your monoclonal antibody, and then you have sufficient analytical data. Whereas now, each submission is a little bit different using different technology, different methodologies, and so we think that this will harmonize things and streamline uh, the implementation uh, and approval of these drug products. So overall, we think that this is going to underpin the uh, regulatory decision and uh, result in higher order characterization uh, with respect to accuracy, precision, and comparability of methods and hopefully at the end translate into overall product safety and efficacy. So with that, I'd like to thank a number of people from my team that have uh, collected data on this uh, throughout this uh, project, as well as a number of additional projects that uh, I didn't talk about today. I wasn't sure how much time we'd have, so I stuck to just the NIST antibody. Uh, but we have a widespread number of collaborators that are now uh, working on the NIST antibody. Uh, we've got about half of the chapters in now and the remainder expected this month. Uh, so both the antibody as well as the book we're hoping to be available uh, in January uh, to really push this project uh, with industry and uh, its implementation uh, throughout uh, Biopharma. So with that, I thank you for your time and be happy to take any questions. Okay, questions. One thing I need to ask, so we do need to use the mic because it's being taped, so. Okay, just a second. My question. Just a second. How do they determine the? I don't think that's not. Hello. Let's go into that. No. So the, the the question is, how do you determine the shelf life of these antibodies? So that's an excellent question. Uh, so those accelerated stability studies are one way. So we'll elevate the temperature or expose it to light, and you can actually model this with the Arrhenius equation and get kinetics to try to guess at the stability of this molecule. So that's the way that we do it initially. Long term, you throw some of this at whatever condition and you test it every couple months. And you actually need to, from day one, you take your interim material, you put it in the freezer, you put it in the fridge, and you put it on the shelf. And every couple of months, you continually test that for stability and uh, consistency with all of those methods. So uh, the uh, charge variant methodologies and SEC are two very commonly used techniques. But throughout the life cycle, you're constantly testing your product, making sure that all those attributes are there. So you have a proposed stability, but it's definitely a difficult question to answer. Yes. I will try loud to be loud as well. Uh, there's a lot of interest in glycated or glycosylated proteins in in the academic world in making these through semi-synthesis to be more homogeneous than nature would make them. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on 
where that's going. One could use unnatural amino acid mutagenesis. One could use oligosaccharide synthesis and combine with, mm -hmm. uh, with protein expression. Is that the wave of the future? Will there be an advantage? What is your sense? So I, I definitely think there is. And actually, when I got to NIST, the first thing they said was, have fun, do some characterization, and, and you know, develop a few methods. But what can we use as an analytical standard? And the first thing that I did was remove the glycan from a protein, leaving just one gluconac. And then I did a chemoenzymatic synthesis, again, using uh, some organic chemistry to make an oxazoline ring and potentially add that by tricking an enzyme to put it on rather than take it off. And there's a lab at uh, the University of Baltimore that does quite a bit of this. So uh, we'd actually thought about that for the, re the reference material. We thought, let's get a homogeneous single glycan IgG or other protein as a reference material because then you can obviously characterize it much better uh, than having this big mess of stuff. Um, so biopharma companies have looked at that as well, and our conclusion on that was we just couldn't scale it up to the size we needed. And I think that's what, uh, as far as the synthetic strategies, biopharma is kind of seeing the same thing. Now, that I did see some technology here today with phage display that very well may change that. <laughs> um, but uh, the way that companies are doing that now is there's actually a, a company called Glycofy that Merck recently bought. And they have a yeast cell line that can produce, they say, uh, homogeneous glycosylation. So they've essentially transfected that to only have certain glycosyl transferase enzymes uh, to lead to a product that should have a limited glycoprofile. And that really is the wave of the future, I think, uh, making some of this glycoanalysis for at least drug products much simpler um, if you can actually make that molecule with tailored glycosylation. Uh, so one of the studies I didn't talk about um, that we've done with the FDA is tuning bioreactor param parameters as well uh, tr to try to get uh, predefined glycosylation. So uh, there's a lot of work in that area, and I think eventually the genetics are going to take over and, and be able to do that for us. So can you, you comment at all about the, within the bioreactor and the, the aspect of uh, the host cell protein contamination situation? Mm -hmm. So I actually think that's, from an analytical perspective, that's a, kind of a, a problem right now. So they're going to the more mass spectrometry-based assays to at least say what's there. But all the products eventually, even the drug products, have some host cell protein in them, and they're using ELISA, ELISA assays to look at that, um, or uh, binding assays with uh, polyclonal IgGs, right? And this is a problem because you need to get that polyclonal from your cell line, and you may not be getting complete sequence coverage. So I think that mass spectrometry is going to play a bigger role uh, going forward. And I'm not really sure what the technology will be that really identifies it, but I think coupling adverse, for, uh, adverse events with uh, certain uh, host cell proteins is going to be something that, you know, eventually to, to monitor specifically uh, with MRM assays or targeted assays to look for particular bad actors. That's going to be important. I have a question for you, too. So I noticed uh, you had a fair percentage of glycation, you noticed, in your product. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just guessing that it looked like it's also part of the difference between your results and the NIBERT results. Have you looked at advanced glycation in products, like in the stress samples? Uh, we actually haven't yet. And um, that's something that I've been thinking about quite a bit because a lot of these products are formulated with sugars in there, so either a glucose formulation, trahalose. And so this glycation could be occurring during the shelf life of the product, and it could clearly affect the effectiveness. So uh, again, we're, we're characterizing at this point of essentially just putting it in as a, a modification in our search parameters, uh, but we haven't looked yet at the advanced glycation products. So. How did you get your trypsin coverage so high? Um, that's really good. Coverage. Yeah. <laughs> so that's at the peptide level again, too. But it's a very long gradient, uh, and we had to optimize the digest quite a bit. Um, so we're using a very large gradient. It's like 120 minutes, I think, for that coverage. So um, it took a while, relatively large injection, and quite a bit of optimization. But. Any other questions? My question is regard to the force degradation stability studies. I assume these are for the actual powder itself or the, the protein intact. How about the dissolution? Are you concerned with when you do these stability indicating studies, the solvent, the excipients that are in those solutions are impacting your, your chromatograms, your impurities, artifacts, et cetera? Also, it's a nice tie, by the way. So, also, also what's that? Nice tie. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned this is Corey. Uh, he was my uh, confidant through grad school and taught me everything I know, including how to tie a tie. So uh, thank you, Corey. So I think your question was, uh, how are the excipients affecting the force degradation studies that we were asking? So typically, so we're doing this on the bulk formulation, which is what we're going to be providing as the reference material. So we're actually doing it in the same excipients uh, that we would normally run. And, and I didn't show it on the SEC, but you can actually see significant changes in, there's L-histidine in here. And in a number of these force degradations, you'll see oxidation of the histidine, and you can pick that up. So they definitely can affect that, and it's something, uh, again, the optimization and understanding with as many detection techniques as you can to see what artifacts those excipients might be giving. Uh, but essentially, we'll do these same force degradation studies on a final formula, uh, formulated product as well and do the same sort of uh, trending to make sure that there's not some excipient-directed uh, change in the product. Any other questions? Okay, well, let's thank him again. <laughs>